Hello and welcome to another one of Filmlight's Baselight Learning Programme sessions. Um, today I'm going to be looking at scopes. Now Baselight has a range of different scopes uh, that you can use to measure various things in your images. Uh, so I'm going to look at how to, all, all the different scopes, how to set them up and some basic uh, functions, what you can actually do with them. Um, I'm not going to be covering any of the more advanced things you can do with scopes. Uh, we won't have time today, so you'll need to come back um, and we'll cover that in a later tutorial. So you'll need to check out for that, that one later. Um, as always, if you've got any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat and I'll uh, go over them at the end. So let me switch over to the Baselight user interface and we'll have a look at some scopes. The simple and standard workspaces always include the histogram, even on a system with a single monitor like this one. If you've got three UI monitors, then one of them will generally show several different scopes by default. and It doesn't normally have anything else. It's literally just a dedicated scopes display. Now, the individual scopes can be docked into the workspace, uh, like the histogram is here. But I'm going to pop my histogram out into a floating window so I just say float histogram um, so we can see it more clearly and I can move it around um, more easily in this window. Now you may have seen histograms in other places such as Photoshop or the viewfinder in a camera. In Baselight the histogram always shows you the red, green and blue channels superimposed on the same set of axes. The histogram plots the relative amounts of R, G and B pixels against their code value. Um, now if I just go back to the previous shot here which is a test image of just grey bars, um, you can see that on the histogram we've got a single vertical line uh, which represents these grey, these different grey bars and there's no shades of grey between them so the histogram is blank in these areas. Now if I click um, anywhere in the image, say for example if I click on this grey bar here um, you can see we've got a blue dot appeared at the top of the histogram and that's showing us the pixels that we're actually selecting in the image and that particular shade of, of grey is around about a code value of 300. Incidentally these code values uh, relate to 0 which is obviously totally black to up to 1023 which is the, the highest level that we can have on the histogram. Now that is actually the full range of a 10-bit signal um, now internally Baselight uses um, a much higher number of bits and it also works floating point but this is actually a hangover from the old um, Cineon DPX days um, but it's really just uh, a scale showing you black at one end and white at the other. Um, now if I uh, go to the shot before this one uh, what I've done here is I've added some horizontal blur to the image so now we've not just got these solid slabs of grey but we've got some intermediate grey colours uh, between each shade of uh, grey and if I now click and drag across those you can see that um, we're now, we've now got some grey colours appearing uh, between these, these separate shades of grey but the, the main dominant colours of the shades of grey are still these original colour uh, grey bars so that's why they're showing with higher peaks than the intermediate shades. If I blur it even more you can see now we end up with obviously much a much smoother gradation we've got more intermediate shades of grey and now the histogram is obviously filling in with all these other shades of grey. So let me go back to the actual uh, a proper image um, and I'll show you a few of the settings that we have available in the histogram. Um, uh, obviously we can just change the size of the window and position it wherever we want and as you've already seen it can be docked into the workspace. Um, if I right click on the histogram we get a pop-up menu. Um, now some of the options in this menu apply to all the scopes and I'll come back to those a bit later on. Um, and the ones at the top just apply to this scope. So the first thing we can do is we can turn off the filling of the histogram. So that now just leaves us with just the curves. Um, I personally prefer to have it filled, it's just a bit easier to see what you've got. Um, we can also change the orientation. Um, now at the moment it's automatic which means that as I, as I change the relative aspect ratio it will change from either horizontal uh, mode which is what it's in at the moment 
to vertical mode, if I switch to vertical mode, you can see now the axes have flipped around. Um, I'll just change it back to the horizontal mode because I, I actually prefer it that way around. Um, um, and the next option that we can do is we can apply some filtering um, to the histogram. Now at the moment you can see that basically it's showing us uh, pretty much it's sampling as many pixels as it can. So we're seeing quite a spiky representation of the histogram. Um, but if we filter it, say add medium, uh, medium strength filtering, we now get a much nicer, smoother representation. And this is generally easier to look at. Um, so I'll leave that set up. And in fact, that's usually the default for, for the settings on the histogram in Baselight. Um, okay, I think, um, I think that's all I really need to cover um, in terms of the settings for the histogram. If I just use this more sort of natural looking image and just click on this, for example, if I click on the, the bonnet of the uh, Austin Healy here, you can see that it's, it's on the histogram, it's showing us the R, G and B content of those pixels and these are the higher peaks in the image so this is the dominant color this color range here of the dominant and we can see that the most of the image is made up of that bluish uh, that sort of light bluish gray color um, if i click on the red car behind um, again you can see that there are peaks here the red here this is mostly red so it's it's got um, mostly the red peak but then we've got some darker blue and green colors down here but again that's another peak you can pick out on the histogram um, there's some some of the other dominant colors so there, there are that's uh, just a, a kind of rough idea of how you can use the histogram you'll also notice that without even without the histogram view open um, we can see the actual RGB pixel values down here um, whenever I hold the mouse down um, we get the, the readout but as soon as I let go the readout disappears but that's a handy way of just checking individual uh, pixel values if you ever need to know what they are in the image. Okay, so that's the histogram. Um, and I'll just close that view for now. The next scope I'm gonna show you is the RGB Parade. And uh, all of these scopes are opened from the Views menu. And the RGB Parade simulates a traditional waveform monitor um, as was used in analog and then digital TV systems. Uh, it shows the RGB channels as separate waveforms, but you can also overlay them on the same axes by clicking, uh, right clicking and then choosing RGB overlay mode. Now you can see that the red, green and blue channels are all combined on the same axes. Now in the days of analog TV, the vertical axis of the waveform display represented the signal level as an actual voltage and um, it showed it as you scanned along each individual line in the image or each individual scanning line in the image. Um, the digital version of the waveform monitor, we provide the same display by plotting the level or the value of the RGB pixels um, in the vertical axis against the horizontal axis, which again still represents the horizontal position along across the image. Um, as with the histogram, if I click on the um, image display, you can see that we get a readout of the pixel, the RGB pixel uh, values um, in the in the scope. Uh, but unlike the histogram, of course, this is showing us um, vertically, it's showing us the code value and horizontally, it's showing us the position along across the image. So if I click here, for example, we can see this is the green, sort of more greeny color of the grass, a little bit darker. And then as I move across the image you can see the colors I'm picking we're now going through that's again that's the sort of light uh, bluish grayish color of the car bonnet um, and they're the dominant colors again you can see where the lines are coming together in the scope we're seeing that's the sort of dominant colors in the image um, and then as I move further over here um, we're picking out other colors as we go further across now the RGB parade display shows us the entire image uh, all in one go and this is made up of each individual line or row across the image, um, all then being superimposed. Now I've got another shot here in the timeline, um, uh, this shot here. And if I add a second cursor and then switch to two cursor view mode and position uh, one of the cursors so that we can see the full image. And then the other cursor um, is actually 
sitting at the bottom and I've got a, a shape here over the image which is only one row of pixels high so what we're now seeing on our parade display is just the line where that shape is overlapping the image effect if I move it off the top I'll move it just down to the top of the image and I'll I'll right click on the scope to bring up the menu and I've got an intensity control for the scope so I'm going to increase the intensity because obviously just looking at one one single row of pixels it's not going to give us such an intense display here and now if I move that down you can see it's picking out the RGB values across that line and when I reach this point here so up here we're just basically just seeing the bright sky here this is that this row here that's the sky if I move the line down here to, to when we start reaching the buildings if I scan along this line here you can see that's still the sky and then here the colors obviously drop down where we cover the roof of that building and then we come back up and we're covering the sky again here and then that's the top of that tower and so on across the image so you can see how if we just look at a single line we just get a single trace or a single RGB trace across the parade display uh, whereas if I switch back now to the full display you can see how they're all now combined all those individual lines are combined together to give us a composite view of the entire frame I'm just going to drop the intensity back down again so that it's um, it looks a bit cleaner okay so let me move back to the shot that we were on before and I'll just switch back to single cursor view mode so we can see the whole image again okay so let's take a look at the other options in the right click menu first there's the video legal overlay and this is currently set to full range but I can change it to video legal range by clicking on this button here now notice that the graticule has shrunk vertically uh, zero percent um, is legal black which is above actual zero black and the hundred percent uh, line here has obviously come down to legal white from the full maximum whites that we can handle in base light now if I also change back to the RGB um, parade display here um, you can see that there are parts of the image that go above the black uh, sorry above the white level and below the black level and these would actually be outside the legal video range if I if I right click here we've also got the option to turn off colored mode so that'll remove the red green blue coloring from the display and you can quite clearly see now that the the areas above 100% um, and below 0% are shaded in red warning you that those colors actually sit outside the legal video range now we don't generally need to worry about legal video levels inside base light um, uh, because these days we grade in full range but when the video comes out of base light as an SDI signal and it goes off to our grading display it's typically scaled to the legal video range as this is the standard for most SDI monitors working in Rec 709 so in base light it's possible to actually set the scope so that we're actually monitoring the signal that's being sent to the SDI monitor and if I right click here we choose the option here image plus true light plus SDI to see the SDI output now at the moment I'm not using an SDI monitor so that won't change uh, but if you bear with me I'll switch my base light system over to send the image rather than to the UI monitor I'll, I'll get it to send to my external SDI display and we can see how the waveform monitor changes when I do that okay so you can see that my uh, workspace layout has changed and obviously you can't see my image display anymore because that's now on my external SDI monitor but you'll also notice that the image the waveform in the parade display is now scaled so that it no longer goes outside the legal video range and that's because uh, if you remember we switched over to show the uh, to, to, to view the scope at the SDI output using this image plus true light plus SDI setting if I wanted to check the uh, grade in my timeline so um, rather than the output from the SDI but what we're actually grading I can switch back to image only and you'll see we now have that full range uh, waveform again I'll just switch back to the SDI output now the SDI output itself can be controlled from the display menu option SDI output and you can see that uh, currently it's set to full to legal um, because my SDI monitor 
uh, requires a legal range input. Now, if you're working with a 444 monitor, um, maybe set to something like P3, it may actually not need a legal range input. It may use a full range input, um, in which case you could change this to uh, one of these two options here, for example, 422 no scale. And again, now you'll see that the output from the SDI is full range. Um, and uh, obviously you need to double check to make sure that that scaling is set correctly. Um, uh, as I said, in most cases, it will need full to legal. And that setting is actually, uh, it will default to whatever is set up in your current setup. Um, so you need to make sure that it's set correctly for the current setup that you're using here. Okay, so while you're grading, even if you're grading on an SDI monitor, uh, generally you would leave this set to image only and make sure that your video overlay is set to full. So that allows you to grade full range without having to worry about seeing those red warning areas in the scope. Now the, f the other option in the True Light SDI setting here is image plus True Light. In fact, it's also in the image plus true light plus SDI. Now, I'm not going to explain that in detail, but essentially that would be if you're using a, an old fashioned workflow where you actually have a true light profile um, in, the, in the monitoring stream itself. Now, we don't generally work that way these days. So as I said, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to explain that right now. OK, I'll switch the machine back to the non SDI output so we can see the actual image display in the UI again. OK, so I'll just go back and have a final look at the other options in the right click menu. Um, uh, I've already shown you the RGB overlay mode um, and also the intensity, which allows you to uh, brighten up a, a dim image in the scope. Uh, it's best to keep that sort of down at a level where you can see a, a decent range of contrast in the scope itself. And then the final two options here are the overlay intensity. Now that's the graticule that's superimposed over the top. Uh, you can go all the way down to zero uh, or bump it all the way up to one. Um, I, I sort of normally leave it around here because it's not too intrusive. And then the final option here is the number of lines uh, which divide the overlay grid. I can change that from 10% which gives us uh, nine lines between zero and 100 uh, or set it to 25. Um, so then obviously we've not got the grid covering so much of the, the waveform. Let me just switch that back to 10%. Okay, the next scope I want to show you is the vector scope or the chromaticity display. Now this has uh, two basic modes, a traditional TV style vector scope, which is selected using the CBCR plot mode, or there are three chromaticity plots now, uh, each of these allow you to view the color information in different ways. We switch back to the vector scope to start off with, and this basically simulates the display of a traditional TV scope, uh, showing the hue of the color as an angle around the scope and the saturation as the distance out from the center. So fully desaturated colors are plotted in the middle, and as the saturation increases, the distance from the center increases. So, for example, if I click on the the fairly desaturated, almost white side of the car here, you can see that those colors are pretty much in the center of the vector scope. If I click on the bonnet, which is quite low saturation, we've got some blue pixels here and the red car over here, which is a lot more saturated. Uh, you can see the colors here and then the green, the green pixels in the grass. These are the, these areas here. These six little rectangular target areas were used with 75% color bars when lining up uh, traditional TV systems. Now, if you've seen a vector scope before, you may have always wondered why the red doesn't line up. In fact, all of them uh, are rotated slightly. So red doesn't line up nicely on the vertical axis. Now, this is actually to do with the way that uh, original analog color TV systems were designed. And I haven't got time to go into the details now, but there are several good explanations on the internet if you feel like having a quick Google after this training session. These days we don't really need to worry about the intricacies of PAL and NTSC colour encoding. So the position of the vectors is less important. And in fact, the default angle of the red primary in our grading controls um, is actually zero degrees or straight up. If you want to line up the vector scope with the trackballs, uh, you can rotate it by minus 14 degrees using the rotate option in the right click menu here. So if I type in 
oops, if I type in minus 14 here, that's rotated it. So now you can see that the red is actually straight up. So that now matches the, uh, the controls that we have in Baselight. Alternatively, if you'd rather leave the vector scope at its more traditional uh, rotation angle, I just set that back to zero. You can rotate the controls, the grading controls um, in Baselight by going to the hue wheel angle setting. And instead we could set that to 14 degrees. And now you can see that the red, if I move, for example, if I move the lift control in the video grade, if I now move it in that direction, or oh, it's a bit sensitive, let me just turn down the sensitivity. If I move it in that direction, you can see that it's now moving along the direction of the red target in the vector scope. Um, so it's something you may want to consider um, when you're setting up base light for your own preferences. Now if we've got an image which is fairly desaturated and we want to see the desaturated colors more clearly, we can magnify the vector scope by, in the same way that we zoom in on the image, we hold down control or command on the Mac and then drag with the middle mouse button and we can zoom as you can see the whole vector scope display will zoom um, that allows us to see these colors a lot more accurately so I'll just zoom back out again so we can see the whole display there are also uh, intensity and um, overlay controls in the right click menu here if you want to adjust the visibility of the scope OK, let's take a quick look at the other chromaticity display modes. As you can see, these all display the colour in a chromaticity plot diagram. If I take the XY plot as an example, this shows how the colours in the image lie within the standard CIE 1931 chromaticity chart, which is probably something you may have seen before. Again, I don't have time to explain it in detail. That will be covered in a more advanced tutorial. But basically, the horseshoe shape around the edge is the limit of colours which can supposedly be seen by an average viewer, and it's called the spectral locus. Within that, we display various different colour gamuts, which are useful within Baselight. For example, the green triangle here is the current viewing colour space, which is set to Rec 1886, 2.4 gamma, Rec 709 and the green cross in the middle is the white point of that colour space, which is D65. The much larger dashed triangle is the working colour space, which is set to film light T log E gamut. If we change the viewing colour space or the working colour space, these gamuts would change accordingly. We can zoom in uh, using control with the middle mouse button, but we can also quickly zoom to see just the viewing colour space using this button here. And as before, if I click in the image, it'll show us the chromaticity coordinate values in the scope. This curved line across the middle of the chart is called the black body locus. It represents the colour which is emitted by a so-called black body when it's heated to different temperatures. For example, in our viewing colour space, the white point is D65, which is very close to the 6500 Kelvin point on the black body locus. As the temperature increases, the colour becomes more blue, and as it decreases, it becomes more orange. So, for example, 2700 Kelvin would be somewhere over here. And finally, we can turn off the overlays, uh, which we don't want to see, and also remove the colour from the plot using these options here. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the time right now to go into any more detail, but as I said, we will cover this in another tutorial. The next scope is the Luma waveform. Uh, oh, OK, so at the moment it can't actually display the waveform because it says not available while RGB overlay mode is enabled. So I need to right click in my parade display and turn off the RGB overlay mode. In fact, I'm going to hide the parade display. We don't need that right now. Uh, so the Luma waveform is similar to the parade, the RGB parade display except that rather than showing RGB values, it's showing us Luma values on the vertical axis. At the moment, the vertical scale is set to a percentage with 10% divisions, 
but as with the parade display I can right click on here and I can change the overlay grid to 25% so we now only have three lines uh, three dividers across the display however the Luma waveform also has the option to show a logarithmic scale and this is very useful when we're grading HDR as it allows us to view a much larger dynamic range without everything being squashed down to the bottom for example if I switch my viewing color space to say PQ 1000 nits uh, you'll notice that the waveform has got squashed down that's because the DRT at the output is now scaling the image differently also obviously the image doesn't look correct anymore because we're not viewing it on an HDR monitor but if I now right click on the Luma waveform and choose for the overlay grid one of these logarithmic scales for example nits base 10 uh, you can now see that the lines across the scope are showing us nits values rather than percentage and this is this is a lot more useful when you're grading HDR in fact if I adjust the gain you can see that because we're using a thousand nits uh, display the DRT is actually limiting that so it can't go above a thousand nits uh, now there are other, other log logarithmic scales available we can choose uh, nits base 10 with uh, two divisions um, between each decade so now we have two lines between a hundred and a thousand and ten thousand um, or we can actually put finer a finer scale on there using three dividers between them uh, but you'll notice now down near the bottom here we've got a, a few too many lines across the display to really see things clearly so we have another option which is this one here which is knit space 10 uh, but perceptual so this is now giving us a roughly equal number of lines up the screen um, so we can still see 10, 100, 1000, 10,000 nits but we've not got loads of lines here obscuring the, the display at the bottom again we've got controls we can vary the intensity of the overlay as well if we wanted to dim it down a bit and we can also vary the, the scope intensity too So you can see the Luma waveform scope is, is a very useful tool when we're grading in HDR. Now I'll just switch it back to Rec 709 mode uh, for the last few things and we'll also put the just the standard percentage overlay on there. And the final scope is the Y prime CBCR parade. This shows the luminance and color components of the image as separate channels. And it's useful if you're using the video grade in Y prime CBCR mode, for example. So if I switch the gain control to sliders mode, and these are all unganged, the first slider adjusts just the Y the luminance of the image. The next slider is the red cyan or the CR component of the, of the image. And then the last one is the CB or the uh, the blue yellow component and if I switch the vector scope back over to traditional um, CBCR mode and just put that alongside you'll see that the the CR control the red cyan um, adjustment moves the vector scope up and down the vertical axis that's the red cyan axis and the CB control the blue yellow moves obviously it moves it horizontally along the blue yellow axis in the vector scope so there are um, a few other settings in the right click menu that I haven't have time to cover today but these will be covered in a future session okay well uh, there weren't any questions uh, in the chat uh, not that I could see so I hope you all learned something um, thanks again for joining um, as I mentioned we will have a, an advanced or another session on scopes uh, showing some of the other features I didn't cover and how to a bit more advanced uh, instruction on how to use them um, to, to measure more specific things in certain circumstances um, so thanks again for watching uh, this video I'll do a bit of editing on it and then again it'll be uploaded to our website uh, along with all the other tutorial videos so I will See you next time. Bye for now.